Welcome to everyone uh, for what I hope is going to be a very interesting and important discussion. I think taking a sort of objective view, uh, the Brexit debate over the last five years has been, um, well, for many, uh, passionate <laughs> and uh, frustrating and difficult, uh, but it has certainly been fascinating. And I think today we're going to have a very interesting uh, and, and very important discussion about uh, as Katie said, the, the landscape uh, for, for opportunities and change and for societal progress as a result of Brexit. Um, now, however you voted or however, however people voted, um, there is a simple fact, which is that we've left Europe uh, and the deal is done. Uh, whatever you think of the deal, it, it's in place. Um, and I think on both sides of the debate, uh, one thing I can say is we actually all want the UK to do well um, out, of, out of Brexit now. Um, and a huge chunk of that involves finding opportunities and embracing them uh, where, we, where we can find them. There's no use saying um, you know, there's absolutely no benefits to Brexit as some ardent Remainers I'm sure will continue to say for many years in the future. It's actually now our responsibility to make the most of, of, of uh, where we are now and for to help Britain succeed where we can. Um, and, uh, and also to point political decision makers in the right direction. Um, it is new territory for everybody, whether you're a member of the public or a member of the cabinet. And governments don't always get everything right. Ministers don't always make the right decisions. Um, and when they are stuck in the kind of day-to-day -day business of running government, it can be quite difficult for them to kind of step back and look at the big opportunities and, and look at the big picture. So actually that's um, a really uh, sort of timely moment for us to be having this discussion because uh, those of us who are connected to, to politicians or, or have influence somewhere can then um, make sure that those in power are making the right decisions for the country. Um, so I know the debate has been very fierce and people will have very strong views, but I would encourage you uh, to be as objective as possible in the discussion tonight and really look at uh, how we can make the most of the uh, opportunities that are available to us. Um, so we have two experts with us today on our panel. Um, Joe Zamet Lucia, who uh, is a founder of Radix, which is a not-for-profit um, public policy think tank. Um, I think Joe, it's fair to say before uh, coronavirus, you were based between the Netherlands and the UK, but you've since had to stick in one place for now. So you're currently in Amsterdam. Um, and Joe also has a huge um, experience uh, in, in the business world um, and is a regular commentator on sort of business and political issues. Um, and we also have Sarah uh, Williams, who has a background in politics, um, working, working in Parliament. Uh, is that right, Sarah? Working in Parliament itself uh, and also uh, in, in public affairs. Uh, and she also coordinates the Green Alliance, which I will not uh, endeavour to tell you what it is. I'll let Kate, well, Sarah do that. Um, but it's really fantastic to have you both here. Um, so thank you very much. Um, what I'd love you both to do just for sort of five minutes um, at the beginning of this discussion is just to introduce yourselves, um, a bit about your work, um, and then just a, a kind of big top line summary of where you think uh, the primary areas for opportunity for the country are. Uh, so Sarah, I'm going to hand over to you first. Thanks, Bess. Yes, I can explain <laughs> what I do in a bit more detail. But yeah, I head up the Secretariat of um, Greener UK, which is a coalition of 12 environmental organisations that came together to ensure that environmental protections and standards were maintained through Brexit. So we've been working on hard, like very hard on this for sort of the past five years and frankly still have a bit more of a way to go, um, but that's that's what I do day to day. And yeah, most of the UK's environmental laws have been derived from European law. We also relied on the sort of European Commission and the European Court of Justice to enforce environmental laws in the UK. So such as things on air pollution, some pretty famous cases, I hope many of you will be aware of. So obviously Brexit did pose a a big change uh, for the environment and how we work to protect it. We face a lot of risks as, as well as opportunities. Uh, we needed to replace with what we were going to lose, but we could also potentially um, move quicker than then when, when we were trying to sort of reach compromises with 27 other member states and design policies that actually work better for the UK specific circumstances. So it's, it's its own wildlife, its habitats, for example. 
And actually, the government certainly pledged to do better on the environment um, than when we're a member of the EU. So it's talked a lot about green Brexit, albeit a couple of years ago, more <laughs> slightly more of the Michael Gove era, but also a lot about becoming a, a world leader on environmental protection and climate change. So I think that the really, like, one really good example of, of making improvements in the environmental sphere um, is actually the recent reforms to how we subsidise farmers so that it's done in a much more environmentally friendly way going forward. Now, I should say a lot of the detail is still to be worked out and we are pretty nervous about the potential impact of new trade deals on farmers and the work they must do in this area. But essentially, we're establishing a new system in the UK, well, in England, where farmers will receive financial support for providing public goods. So these are services that society sort of needs farmers to provide, but which are not sort of paid for through the market. So things like um, restoring habitats, providing cleaner water, improving the quality of the soil. So being able to leave the EU's common agriculture policy and establish this new system is, is such a clear environmental benefit. I mean, it's absolutely huge. Um, so I think that's just the, the really big one that I'd, I'd flag. And as I said, more work is still needed. A lot of the details still to go. And so we'll continue to be sort of pushing the government in, in a more ambitious direction as we possibly can. But there are some other areas that we're sort of working on at the moment. We now have more flexibility in how VAT is applied. <laughs> it sounds quite small, but we could more easily reduce the rates on things that are better for the environment. So sort of repair services, for example, we can also go further, particularly on animal welfare, which I know is a sort of subject close to quite a few political hearts at the moment. But I mean, for example, the government is going to end the live export of animals for slaughter, which we couldn't previously do um, owing to sort of the EU's own, own rules on the movement of animals. But I say for, for Greener UK, um, our biggest focus at the moment is the Environment Bill which is currently going through Parliament sort of as we speak. Uh, peers were debating it till quarter to midnight last night. So it's really, <laughs> it's really current, it's really fresh. Um, so yeah, this bill will set out a new framework for environmental law post-Brexit. So, and then also a couple of other things like a new system for environmental targets. And particularly it establishes a new environmental watchdog. So it's going to be called the Office for Environment, for Environmental Protection that's going to sort of work in England and hopefully Northern Ireland. And that's there to replace the work of the European Commission. So it's had to hold government and other public bodies in the, sort of in England to account on, on the environment, on the environmental laws to make sure that they're, they're not being broken. So it's, yeah, it's a really exciting moment. Um, it's actually the first environment bill in 20 years. So it's certainly the first that I've worked on, um, but we still need to strengthen it as it's, as it's sort of the current mechanisms it's introducing are frankly weaker than those that they are replacing. Ultimately for us to capitalize on the opportunities to improve the environment post Brexit, we need the right building blocks in place. And that's not what we've got at the moment. We need this new environmental watchdog to be properly independent from government. We need a role, a bigger role for parliament so sort of in appointing sort of its chair and its board members. We need government to have no say in how it enforces environmental law. Right now, the government has a power to sort of provide guidance, um, which is a great if, <laughs> if this body is there to sort of mark its homework, the government really shouldn't be, um, shouldn't, really shouldn't have a role in advising, advising bodies to do that. So yeah, as I said, it's, it's currently being debated in the House of Lords, and we really hope that peers are going to make some really important changes. We will then all need to sort of lobby our members of parliament in the autumn to try and make some of those changes stick, but we'll sort of see how we go there. We also need to keep up the pressure on government in, in a number of other areas. That's just, just one um, just to pick out now, but it's sort of when government's negotiating new trade agreements. I don't think we've not really discussed very much as a, as a country, like what we want from our trade deals. It looks like the government really just wants to get as many done as, as possible. We now have a chance sort of as a country that is able to agree its own trade deals to make sure that they actually work for our environmental and climate goals, for, for, other, for our other public policy objectives, rather than undermine them, which is sometimes the case. Unfortunately, we're not really capitalizing on that opportunity so far. The recent UK Australia agreement in principle looks like it could be very harmful for environmental standards, which is um, unfortunate to say the least. Um, so yeah, there's certainly opportunities, but still a huge amount of risk. And I guess, yeah, it's incumbent on all of us to keep watching, to keep campaigning, to make sure the government moves in the right direction. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, Joe, uh, your five minutes. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background uh, and where you see the primary um, lie of the landscape is. So uh, <clears throat> my background is mainly in business. I, um, I worked for, well, first of all, I trained as a doctor. I trained in medicine, but then moved into business and um, worked in multinational companies before founding my own business, which I eventually sold. Then I spent some time in the environmental world, um, then moved into the political world. And now, as you said, I've, uh, I'm involved in this uh, uh, political think tank that we call the think tank of the radical center. Um, <clears throat> so that's my background, kind of varied because I have a low boredom threshold. Um, <clears throat> and I was interested in your comment about taking an objective look at Brexit, which I thought was a kind of emotional impossibility for most people. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but anyway, we are where we are. And, you know, Brexit was a political act. So, and, and it's, if you like, maybe reflective of a long-term trend that we're seeing towards, you know, people wanting smaller units of governance. So, you know, you know, the Czech Republic and, and Slovakia split up, Yugoslavia split up into various countries, you know, the Catalans want to leave, Scotland wants to leave. So, you know, the kind of, the kind of grand mega globalist supranational thinking of the 20th century is probably a little bit past its sell-by date. And one can see Brexit, if you like, politically, as being, you know, another bit of that jigsaw. You know, whether one agrees with it or not, it seems to be the kind of political trend that has been growing over the past 20 years. Um, and, you know, we'll see where it goes. But, but I think that there seems to be a desire for smaller units of political governance rather than bigger units of political governance. And maybe we can take Brexit in that context. Um, <clears throat> regarding business, you know, business, there's no such thing as business. <laughs> um, you know, there are many businesses, uh, all of which are different uh, and all of which change of whatever sort will affect in different ways. So, you know, your corner, how the change that follows Brexit will affect your corner sandwich shop is going to be very different from how it affects Rolls-Royce. Um, so, so there's no such thing as business. Uh, it's, it's different businesses. And in general, most businesses, most established businesses, don't like change. You know, they've got used to making their money and running their business, and they've built their business patiently over a period of time in, in um, you know, on, on, a, on a sort of, on how things are. Um, and change disrupts that. And it's therefore uncomfortable for some people it's less uncomfortable and maybe desirable for people with a more entrepreneurial spirit who see change as a great opportunity. Uh, again, there's no such thing as business. So some people will see change as a source of opportunity. Some will see it as a headache uh, because now they have to do things differently. Um, <clears throat> but you know, change is what drives innovation. And, um, and if businesses get too comfortable, then they don't innovate. I mean, why should they? Uh, so, so, you know, there is something to be said for forcing change on people. Now there's a question about pace, you know, how you know, pace of change, how quickly businesses can reasonably adapt. Uh, the bigger the business, the more difficult it is to turn on a dime. Um, so, you know, but then again, although Brexit seems a sudden occurrence, it really hasn't been. 
Um, you know, first we had a referendum, then we had a, this long period of seemingly endless negotiation. Um, now, then we had the transition period. Now there are still discussions ongoing. There are still things that have been prolonged. So it's, it's been actually a pretty gradual process and will continue to be a gradual process. Um, and businesses will adapt. You know, at least the businesses that will survive will adapt. And um, those businesses that don't adapt won't survive. It's just the normal, <laughs> you know, it's just the normal process of creative destruction. Um, from, from another perspective, the opportunity for business in general and, and, and their representatives is that they now have to dialogue just with the UK government and the UK governance system. So it's maybe easier to find bits of common interest um, in enacting new legislation, in, 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 in defining how markets should function. It's, it's easier or should be easier to look after British business interest because it doesn't have to be balanced against the wide variety of interests of 27 other countries. Um, so, you know, th there should be more ability to have productive dialogue. Um, you know, I, I mean, Sarah talked about the environmental side and of course she comes at it from that perspective. Um, and, you know, that perspective will have to be balanced against other perspectives um, that will be arguing for different things. Um, and, and, you know, government will have to find that balance. But again, that balance will need to be found in the context of the UK uh, political and, 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 and economic scene. It doesn't have to be balanced against 27 other countries. So, you know, Sarah won't be having to battle against the interests of Poland who want to keep spewing out coal. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's um, there will be other issues that will go in other directions. Uh, but but the conversation will be more contained um, and, the, and there should be therefore more opportunities. About international trade, um, we'll have to see how that um, evolves. Uh, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I feel that too, you know, sometimes too much is made out of international trade and the, the opportunities of international trade. You know, it's important for big multinational companies, particularly in terms of supply chains. Um, but most business, the vast majority of business is domestic. Um, if you look at um, the actual benefits that accumulate from international trade agreements, they're actually relatively small. I mean, they calculated that, that the benefits of the new NAFTA replacement is less than a tenth of 1% of GDP. Um, and one has, to, one has to kind of question whether it's worth a disruption for all of that. Um, but nevertheless, they're politically very symbolically important. Um, and they're not going to go away anytime soon. And they do affect different sectors asymmetrically. Uh, so, you know, some people will benefit more, some, some sectors will benefit more than others, and some sectors will lose more than others. Um, so that, that's another balance that is going to have to be struck. How it will all pan out post-Brexit, I think we'll just have to wait and see. But I think it's a stimulus for business to, for businesses to innovate and to look at the world in a different way and to say, okay, this is a new world. What does Brexit tell us about the state of the world in general? And how do I adapt to that new world, which is coming? I'll stop there. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, I'm very fascinated with what you said about the, the wider geopolitical trend for kind of smaller political units, as it were, whether that's, you know, 
Catalan independence, whether that's Scotland, whether that's um, you know sort of anti-globalization movement, etc. Just uh, sort of touching on the environment, that is one policy area where you absolutely need international cooperation in as large a unit as you possibly can. Uh, you know, it's called global warming for a reason. Um, Joe and, and then Sarah, do do um, chip chip in if you've got some thoughts. I mean, how do we combat that kind of political trend? We've got COP twenty six coming up. Um, you know, there's movement happening, uh, but how do we ensure that the uh, political trend for smaller and smaller decision making units does not undermine the sort of wider climate change battle and the need to have more and more agreements between countries that are very, very large level, you know, you're talking Russia, China, America, and the EU and Britain now. I mean, how do we how do we navigate that uh, in future? Uh, Joe, Joe first, and then and Sarah, I'd love to hear from you on that. So, so I don't see a conflict in that at all. Um, because I think that uh, <clears throat> it, it, you're right, these are global problems, they have a lot of externalities. So you know, what we what China does affects us, what we do affects other people. Um, but I think you, you quite rightly say that there is a need for collaboration. And I think that it is the spirit of collaboration that we need to find, not the spirit of coercion. Because coercion um, engenders resistance. Um, and I think that the late 20th century uh, global governance model where is what has generated this backlash. You know, I don't want to be told what to do by the World Bank or the IMF, or frankly, even Brussels. You know, I'm happy to collaborate, I'm happy to discuss, but if, if the psychology changes from, um, from a, a, a feeling of collaboration, that we're trying to work together. We all have different interests, let's accept that. But can we find a way of working together? But if the psychology changes from that to one of coercion, then you'll get a backlash and you'll get people you know, basically pulling out and digging their heels in. And if I have one criticism of the environmental movement, it's that they do tend to work towards coercive um, solutions. And I just don't think that works. Sarah, what are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I was, I was pleased to hear you said you didn't think the, the, the move to smaller units was <laughs> got in the way, hopefully, of sort of multi, uh, multilateral action. It's, it's good to hear that we've, we've got, yeah, COP26 one in, in three, four months time. And I think actually thinking back to the failure of previous climate conferences before the Paris Agreement was formed was, was basically because of exactly what you said. It was a, a top-down process and, and people weren't bought in. And actually, the great thing about the Paris Agreement is that it's, it's, it's much more bottom-up. So, so fingers crossed, really. And um, well, I think the UK government has a has a big mountain to climb ahead of COP26 in, and the, perhaps, unfortunately, I'd say things like aid cuts isn't going to help, <laughs> isn't going to help that challenge what we saw this afternoon. But just very quickly, just thinking about um, working together, because as, as you are right, I mean, we're far more likely to tackle the climate crisis, the nature crisis, when we do cooperate with other countries. And I'd say particularly probably our neighbours who we, who we still have a lot in common with on the environment. And so, I mean, we were really pleased that obviously a deal was reached in December last year, but it's, it's very sort of light on sort of future cooperation mechanisms and um, sort of what you do with shared ambition, which we still have on, on climate in particular, what we could do in the joint, joint space. And I think this sort of leaves much to do for both sides to continue to work together to try and, and sort of occupy that space and sort of the wider political tensions haven't helped at all. I think we sort of thought we might have a bit of a space uh, post when we finally left to sort of move into that more cooperative area which as I said works better for the environment frankly but we're still we're still waiting but um I think it's a it's a long game and we're obviously happy to happy to wait it out a little bit longer. Definitely um and 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 uh, Joan interesting what you're saying about um sort of uh, influence rather than coercion uh, is is the name of the game obviously when Britain was 
central to the European Union, we had a lot of influence. Um, you know, things like uh, the common agricultural policy, which, uh, which Sarah, you mentioned in your introduction, I think no ardent Remainer I have ever met supported the common agricultural policy from an environmental point of view. And obviously we were trying to influence that from the inside. Um, how do we, and Sarah, over to you first, I mean, how do we go about using Britain's newfound kind of freedom on environmental regulation to influence our European neighbours to start with and then also you know the rest of the world I mean is it about kind of demonstrating best practice and showing what can be done is it about about trying to foster a kind of sense of healthy competition between uh, our EU friends and us uh, about how we can kind of do more and more on the environment what would you say is the way we can use that kind of soft power that we do have to influence rather than coerce and then how does that kind of translate to the wider world beyond the European Union? Yes, yeah, so it's a it's a great question. Um, and yeah, I think particularly in on environmental matters, climate change in particular, the UK played a huge role, um, as sort of Joe alluded to with sort of with regards to um Poland's poor performance on coal. The UK was was really key in sort of pushing for a lot greater climate ambition and, and definitely had a sort of a greater proportion of, of work to do and sort of the joint environmental targets that the EU committed to. And so sort of one of the, was the downsides, I think, from the EU perspective was to lose sort of the UK's influence in, in that area. And as I said, it's why it's important, I think, that they don't, they don't lose influence in that area. I think we've got some, got various things that we need to work through, sort of how, how as I said, that there isn't very, it's not much clarity, there's not much formal structures, say, for the UK and the EU to continue to work together. There are a few sort of things in the, um, the trade and cooperation agreement that the UK could utilize, but I think it's gonna sort of, it's gonna rely very much on our sort of diplomatic service continuing to go out there and and um, and get, get into capitals and, and continue to instead explain what the UK is up to and, and how it intends to keep being, how it intends to keep sort of walking the talk on, on leadership instead of and not just just saying it. So yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely a mix of both, definitely um, needing to actually show that you can deliver on the ground in lots of these areas and really point to the other benefits of having sort of strong environmental policy or, or whatever policy that you're needing to influence on. And then, yes, as I said, that example can hopefully be utilized around the world. And we said we do have a great diplomatic network. We probably need to invest a lot more in that now Sort of post Brexit, and uh, and as I said, unfortunately, stories like cut against uh, the cut of UK aid really doesn't help that. Like, unfortunately, global Britain is going to be defined in a negative way because of that. And I'm not sure necessarily we've done a great deal of job, great deal of work to sort of show the positives of global Britain. So I guess we need to double down and, and make the case. But I think, yeah, it would be uh, it's, <laughs> any levers that we can pull, I think, will be really important. And being the president of COP26, obviously just having had the G7, that was sort of the first sort of areas that the UK could really try and, and make its mark. And um, I obviously very glad that environment was a big focus of that. But um, yeah, I suppose there's got plenty of other avenues that the UK will have to have to work in. But I think, as I said, it will have to work a, a bit harder to try and get, get people on board, as it were. Yes, a lot more for the government to do. Uh, and Joe, sitting in uh, in Amsterdam as you are, What's can you enlighten us on the view from uh, your compatriots over there on not just Brexit as a whole, obviously, but but around you know where Britain's influence, where, where Britain may have influence on countries like the Netherlands or, or and the EU more broadly? Um, it'd be really interesting to get a, an outside perspective. Well, I, I think we we have to be realistic about the the state of play and the stage that we're at. Um, you know, at the moment, we're in the immediate post-divorce stage. So, um, you know, the, the UK is like, you know, the guy or the woman who's left home with a newfound freedom and not quite know what to do with it and feeling very good about themselves, but not quite know what to do with their freedom. And the EU feels a little bit like, like the jilted bride. So, you know now is not the moment to be trying to influence the EU from the UK. It, it's just a waste of time, a total and utter waste of time. Um, and, 
neither is it a priority. You know, the UK government is, is I think, rightly focused on making the UK work and making it successful. Uh, influencing EU policy is somewhere number 7065 on the priority list, and so it should be. Um, so so I, I don't think that UK influencing EU policy, I mean, it was difficult enough when we were in the EU, <laughs> um, you know, to try and do it now in this, in this raw emotional stage is, is, is just delusional. Um, so, so I, I don't think that's the issue. Um, you know, the UK will do its thing, uh, whether it's on environmental stuff or on the many other areas that, that the UK has to find a way forward. Um, and, you know, global Britain, let's not forget, global Britain is a political slogan. Let's not pretend it has meaning yet. <laughs> um, you know, that meaning has to be found but it's a useful, it was, it has been a useful political slogan. Uh, but what it means in practice is still to be determined. Um, and we'll see, you know, it's, it will emerge in, in some way or other. Um, the Dutch perspective, I can talk about the Dutch perspective. The Dutch are pragmatists. Um, the Dutch are about doing business. <laughs> um, they liked having the UK as part of the EU um, because we're very close in world views and approach to things. The UK is a little bit more ideological. I mean, the Dutch are totally unideological. You know, it's it, as long as it's good for business, I don't really care what it is, is, is the Dutch view. Um, um, but, but by and large, you know, countries like the Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, um, all these countries feel the UK has been a loss to them, if for no other reason that they could always hide behind the UK to be the troublemaker and to defend their corner. Now they have to defend their corner themselves. <laughs> um, and, and they've lost the heft of a bigger country. So it's, it's not been a good experience uh, for them. You know, it's not something they welcome. Um, but, you know, the attitude the Dutch will take is, OK, how can we keep doing business together? <laughs> It'll benefit both of us. Let's find a way. Uh, that would be their perspective. Thanks. Yeah, that's very, very helpful. Um, I wanted to touch on uh, immigration um, as immigration was such a fundamental part of the arguments, particularly made by the, the vote leave side during the referendum. Um, unfortunately, Tamid, uh, as Katie said, is unable to make it this evening, and he is our resident immigration expert. Um, but I did want to get a sense from, from you both, um, and Joe, jo, I'll start with you. Um, what, particularly from a point of view of, of business and, and the industry and the skills that we need in this country, uh, what opportunities do you see there are given we have now you know, much more control over our immigration policy in terms of European Union citizens. Um, and, and how do you think the government should be deploying immigration policy? It's been in the news recently uh, for you know, numerous reasons about boats and channels and things like that, which pro probably are a bit of a distraction given the, 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 the small numbers of asylum seekers that come into the country uh, over the channel. Um, uh, but you know taking a kind of longer term view how do you think we should be taking advantage of any opportunities that are available to us now that immigration policy is 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 uh something that we control uh, much more yeah so so uh, I, I i'll answer your question but i'll answer one you didn't ask first <laughs> <laughs> which is is immigration important for the voter <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and, you know, if you look at the polling and you look at, at what people put up there as being important to them, immigration became important to voters when the political class made a lot of noise about it. <laughs> um, so it was a consequence of people, of, of the political class talking about immigration that people focused on immigration. It wasn't the other way around. It wasn't that the politicians picked on immigration because everybody in the UK was obsessed about it. Um, and following the Brexit referendum, you know, the importance of immigration in voters' minds has plummeted again because nobody talked about it anymore. Um, so that, that's one thing. 
Uh, now, immigration has, you know, many sides to it. Um, so the first thing I think is the point that you made, which is that the UK now has the opportunity to put together an immigration policy that it feels suits its purposes. Um, whereas before it had limited control over that, it had no control on immigration from Europe, it had control on immigration from elsewhere. So now at least it has the opportunity to tailor immigration policy to the, to the perceived needs of the country. Now, if you ask half a dozen politicians what the, the immigration needs of the country are, you'll probably get 10 different views. Um, and this is something that's going to be a, a matter of discussion. So one could take the view that, you know, what would benefit the country most is a system that allows in the most highly skilled and attracts the most highly skilled. There's another view which says, well, actually, what we need is somebody who's going to pick the bloody strawberries. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's, it, the answer is not straightforward. Um, and, and we'll have to find ways uh, to, to look at it. From a business perspective, I think you could take two, again, two opposing views. One view is that business needs immigration to get the skills. Uh, and that is important for business competitiveness. The opposing view is that that's very short-sighted and that what business should be doing is actually training the local population more instead of relying on, on people who've been trained by other people who come here for three or four years and then go back. Um, and we never train our local workforce and improve our local skills. So these are two different views and reasonable people can reasonably disagree on, on which view should prevail. Um, so I think, you know, my view on immigration is there is no right answer that the government just has to make a choice and design an immigration policy that it feels would be most appropriate. And there'll be people who'll agree with that and there'll be people who disagree with that. And that's just the way of life. <laughs> Yeah, and I, th I think it's very, very interesting you say, I mean, it's uh, definitely opposing views. <laughs> um, some would say we need to upskill our workers, some would say we need to just, it, it sort of it, get more people to come over. I think what perhaps the pandemic has shown us with sort of shortages with lorry drivers and um, care workers and others is that actually perhaps we need to be a little bit more self-reliant when it comes to the skills of our own uh, workforce. Um, we can't just always rely on cheap imported labour. Um, Sarah, what's what's your view on 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 those two different views? Do you do think we should be upskilling workers or or just getting a sort of Eastern European strawberry pickers to pick our strawberries for us so we can enjoy them over, at, at Wimbledon? Yeah, well, I certainly think we need a, a sort of a better skills policy, um, particularly obviously transitioning to a, a zero carbon future will require a lot of investment. I think elsewhere but actually for me this whole sort of debate is just a really good example of a much wider phenomenon that sort of UK governments are now the UK government is now on its own um, I also follow sort of Lord David Frost the sort of was Brexit chief negotiator now the, the minister in charge of sort of um, Brexit more generally he talks a lot about sort of standing now on or failing on our own abilities and I think this is going to be a real key test um, you've, you've had it in obviously various different policy areas. I think probably immigration is probably the biggest one where you, you've had the UK government sort of potentially blaming scapegoating <laughs> the EU for various issues. Um, it sounds a bit like that was what other, other governments were doing <laughs> with regards to the UK being in the EU. But, um, but yeah, I think this is going to be a really, really big one where the, yeah, it's up to the UK government now to make the right decision and it's as I said it's gonna be a, a tricky one but um but it's yeah government and we'll need to engage in those debates as, as much as we possibly can um mm. again it's a, the trend of smaller governments is help, more helpful there because we, we really can more directly lobby so I, I think this is actually if I can react to that I, I think I think this 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 comment of you know there's no more blaming Brussels for things is, is very valuable 
um, because you know people they now can have try. To, they can try <laughs> people people can now have you know the government now has to stand on its own two feet and say you know i've made this decision um and that's and that's that, that's the end of it and i think psychologically i think that's that's very important um but the other thing i would say is with with things like immigration i don't think there is a right decision <laughs> i think there is just a choice you have to make well, and, and, and providing certainty, you know, that's, that is the role the government can play, is providing certainty to, to business, to people who want to come and work here, uh, to, to charities and everyone. That is the leadership role the government needs to take. And I guess when we were part of Europe and could blame Brussels for everything, you, they didn't need to provide that certainty necessarily uh, in some areas. But, but I think that's something that the government needs to step up. Um, we've talked, so we talked a bit about the environment, we talked about immigration, we talked a bit about business and trade policy, et cetera. Um, you know, there's also state aid, which is, which is well, we should in theory have more control over state aid and things like that. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about the risks. And I, from my point of view, one of the primary risks is actually the politics getting in the way of those good decisions that need to be made. Um, how do you think, you know, what, what do you think the risks are of the politics, um, you know, sort of echoes of the leave remain divide governments trying to grandstand on certain issues is that a genuine risk uh, it, will that stop uh, you know progress being made on the environment or immigration or um leveling up or global britain or whatever it is and how do you think we can mitigate against that joe, uh, joe over to you first well i i uh, <clears throat> i guess i'm not sure i buy into your frame of it um these are all political decisions. So how can politics get in the way? The, you know, politics is what all these things are about. Um, the, these are all political decisions. You know, how we tackle the environment is a political decision. How we make, you know, what immigration policy we have is a political decision. You know, what trade agreements we, we sign is a political decision. These are all political decisions. So it's not clear to me what is meant by the idea of politics getting in the way. I, I mean, I mean, the politics of Brexit, you know, the, the leave remain divide people uh, continuing that fight or, or governments trying to demonstrate their uh, support for one side or other, the, the kind of cultural uh, element that, that we saw over the last. Yeah, so, so I think I think that, you know, to, to the extent that that plays in and, and over time that will fade. But, you know, whether it'll take five years, 10 years or 50 years, I have no idea. <laughs> um, uh, maybe it'll take as long as something else more important comes along. Um, but, you know, this is the government that gave us Brexit. So it should be in the interest of this government to make it a huge success. <laughs> um, you know, I think that should be motivation enough politically. Now, whether they can pull it off, whether they can pull it off is a different question. <laughs> Sarah, from your point of view in, in the environmental world or indeed beyond, I mean, are there areas in which, um, you know, political issues have prevented progress? Uh, and, and how do you think we can avoid those in future? Well, I mean, as, as I sort of alluded to a bit, the fact that sort of the toxicity of Brexit politics is, is still so still so present, I think, has been very unfortunate. I mean, as I said, for the, for the sake of the environment, we still need to be cooperating closely with our neighbours. And there are various things uh, in the final deal that could have could have gone further and could have been better if if I think the wider context was, was slightly more improved. I don't know, sort of the biggest political risks I think we sort of face, for me, it's, it's not really a, a, a Brexit issue as such. It's more about the character of, of this government, which is one that doesn't tend to seem to like accountability very much. I mean, we've seen that obviously in the environmental space with the with the move for, to make the new Office for Environmental Protection a lot weaker than it could have otherwise have been. But we're seeing sort of reforms to judicial review and there's sort of other things like the changes to law around protest, et cetera. So I think for me, there's a various sort of currents going on in, in wider politics that are unhelpful. But, um, Yes, I have the idea that we'll probably be trying to deal with the ramifications of, or the political ramifications of Brexit for 5, 10, 50 years, I think is probably unfortunately right. It does make me feel slightly tired, though, when we've got plenty of opportunities. Yes, bored even. Yes, indeed. 
Well, <laughs> right. uh, and so, you know, a government that perhaps likes to mark its own homework more than it should necessarily do so, um, uh, and not necessarily liking accountability. Uh, Sarah, what, what do you think conduit members can do to try and hold the government to account on these, whether it's, you know, in their professional work or in their charitable and political activity? You know, how can we try and encourage the government uh, to embrace these opportunities or indeed in our own lives, you know, ignore the government completely and embrace these opportunities regardless? What, what would you say, Sarah? Well, as someone who yeah, previously worked for an MP, you'd, you won't be surprised to know that I think lobbying them is, is very important. I mean, obviously, some MPs are potentially sort of more interestingly placed than others, but um, it's, always, it's always really good for, for them to hear from their constituents in whatever sort of area that people are, are um, interested in. But I think also particularly for um, businesses who, are, who do sort of lobby into government, and so that's not just MPs, that's, that's civil servants, that's ministers, for example, like, as we were just talking about, the sort of our relationship is, is now a lot more direct with the people. Well, the sort of decision making um, processes is is, is 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 closer, as it were. So we should theoretically have a, a lot more sort of a bit, bit bit easier to to have that sort of influence. I think, unfortunately, on things like trade policy, it's um, it's this sort of MPs have sort of not given themselves a role in that process, which is un unfortunate for them. So I think we just have to keep reminding uh, the government via sort of public statements and, and sort of more sort of outsider campaigns about what the sort of UK public is concerned about in those sorts of areas. So you've seen some amazing, amazing petitions recently sort of from the NFU, et cetera, of like a million people signing up to things. And I think it's gonna to have to be a lot more of that sort of stuff as well. But yeah, I think if we if we have if we have relationships with civil servants, with government, with MPs, then we absolutely need to utilize them as much as we possibly can. A good call to arms there. Joe, do you have anything to add on how our members can uh, take things forward themselves? Yes, I mean I think that, you know, <clears throat> obviously that the members have their own businesses and their own lives to lead, so they'll have to adapt to the new environment. Uh, but I wanted to echo what Sarah said. And, you know, the world has changed very dramatically in the 21st century. You know, in the past, it was only established institutions that could hold the government to account. Um, now, you know, with, social, with the social media space, with, with with a very, very vibrant and very well-developed civil society and everything else, there are, you know, huge numbers of different pressures um, holding the powerful, and it's not just government, you know, it's big business, it's, it's everybody else, holding people to account. So, so, you know, the balance of power has changed quite dramatically in the last 20, 30 years. Um, and, you know, scrutiny now comes from very, very many different angles and pressure now comes from very, very many different angles. So, so I'm less worried about this. I think, I think it's, it's changed. Um, I think actually the level of accountability has increased, uh, but not necessarily in the old fashioned way not necessarily in the kind of formal institutionalized form. Um, and I think the new method is actually better because it's less subject to corruption, you know, less subject to, you know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of thing and, and deals in a smoke filled room. You know, all those things are things that are much more difficult to do today because there is more transparency and there's more, you know, civil society activity. Um, so I'm very optimistic about, about accountability. Good, good. I'm glad there's some optimism here. Um, so I want to move on to a few questions that have come in um, from, from the audience and do keep them coming. Um, firstly, over to you, Sarah. Um, Africa has the smallest continental carbon footprint globally, but is expected to comply with first world global uh, climate change targets. Um, how do you think the UK now outside the EU can use its influence to drive climate change solutions and innovation uh, in other countries, particularly developing countries? Um, and do you think we're in a better, the country, the UK is in a better position to do that now that we're outside the EU? Uh, or do you think we're in a weaker position to, to drive that climate change innovation in, in other parts of the world? 
Well, potentially not a, in a, a better position, but I think what really has made a huge difference and will hopefully for the next sort of 15 months is, is the, uh, the UK's presidency of the COP26 climate change summit. So it sort of takes up the presidential baton actually in November in Glasgow and then has the presidency for, for an entire year. So it will be in, incredibly incumbent on sort of the UK to make sure that um, these developed countries are, are brought on in that process and are and the, sort of the whole process delivers things like cli climate finance, like addressing loss and damage, et cetera. I mean, these are things that my climate colleagues could, could talk at for a very, very long time. But I feel that actually we've just been so lucky um, in this space to have that presidency because it's hopefully, it sort of <laughs> re-establishes the UK sort of global um, global role in a very, in a very sort of quick way on, on climate action. But um, the real, I think the real, uh, the, sort of the real thing that the UK will need to do is, is delivering, uh, here as well and showing that you can settle these things and 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 actually deliver on them so we've got a lot of a lot of asks into government at the moment but i think um showing that that change is, is possible in a way that's sort of economically valuable and then and then sort of um sort of exporting expertise etc will be really useful but as i said the presidency of cop 56 is is going to be absolutely crucial and and hopefully will big make a big difference yeah Great. Um, thanks, Kate, Sarah. And then one for you, Joe. Um, one of the reasons uh, some campaigned for leave is that um, British jobs would be protected uh, if we left the European Union, sort of echoes of Gordon Brown's British jobs for British workers. Um, uh, how does protectionism uh, influence the, the kind of job market? You know, does that have an impact on demand and supply uh, in, in the jobs market? And um, what should the should the government be doing about that to protect British jobs if they should be protecting British jobs? Um, and and how do we ensure that any route down the protectionist uh, agenda, sort of state aid, etc., doesn't uh, harm the jobs market? I mean, this is a very complicated issue, <laughs> um, and I don't like words like protectionism because they're emotionally loaded words and it's not clear what they mean uh, <clears throat> you know i mean you know it, it's not clear what they mean in specifics um so so you know i i, I like to avoid words like that because it gets gets it, it it tends to divide people and that's not helpful um so so you know, the, the issue is now we're outside the European Union. Um, we can make our own trade policy. Um, and, you know, what should that trade policy be in the 21st century? I think, frankly, is still to be explored. Um, and, you know, we obviously want jobs in the UK. Uh, some people will argue that as long as there are jobs in the UK, it doesn't matter if they're filled by a British person or a Polish person. Other people will argue the opposite. Um, but the reality is that we jobs will be filled by people who have the skills. Um, and it's incumbent on us, I think, to create those skills. Um, the... I think the issue of jobs is more a legacy of the deindustrialization de process that we went through in the late 20th century. And where essentially British workers, and not just British workers, American workers, European workers, were competing with workers in Asia who were being paid a dollar a day. You know, so, you know, businesses were moving their production. They weren't moving their production from Leeds to Bordeaux. <laughs> they were moving it, they were moving it to Vietnam. <laughs> um, and, and that's still there. Um, so, you know, that the industrialization process caused a huge amount of damage. Um, which is still there in these communities 40, 50 years later. And, and we still don't know how to rebuild that. Uh, 
So, you know, I just don't know what is meant by protectionism and, and, and you know, in, in, ter in, in specific terms. Uh, I don't believe that the UK is going to become a closed economy. I don't think that's what the UK has ever been about. You know, after all, the UK was the first, the first to break with mercantilist thinking. Um, and I don't think that UK politics will support a closed economy. The question is, how open do you want to be? And in what ways do you want to be open in order to stimulate a successful economy that's fit for the 21st century? And these are questions that I think are still to be explored because nobody knows the answer. Yes, that's definitely true. Um, fantastic. Well, and that's all we've uh, got time for in terms of questions. So thank you very much to those of you who submitted those. Just very quickly before we go, um, Joe and Sarah, if if our members want to find out more uh, about about the opportunities around Brexit, where would you suggest they go? Joe first. I would suggest they go into their own minds and their own and their own imagination. <laughs> um, I don't I don't think that anybody has the answer. I think this is a new situation. Um, and what we need is fresh thinking and creativity. Um, so, you know, think out of the box and and speak to your colleagues with an open mind and see what emerges from your discussions. May, may be able to create an entire new industrial policy with that. Yes. Uh, Sarah, what, what would you suggest? Is there anywhere people can find out more information, particularly around the, the Environment Bill and, and COP26 and things like that? Yeah, sure. I don't think I can beat that. But particularly around those two, I can I can definitely suggest. I mean, any of the sort of coalition members' websites would be a really great start on, on an item of the Environment Bill. Who, who are the coalition members? Sorry. Well, I'd start off with Greeny UK website and you can find them from there. But um, Brilliant. yeah. But other, I mean, otherwise we'll have to be, I think, very much scouring the government's websites as well, because I don't know, they'll be doing a lot of policy development and we need to we need to feed into that. So that's another, another good read, I'm sure. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, both of you, Joe and Sarah, for, for sharing your, your wisdom and your thoughts. Um, I'm sure as a nation, we will learn much more about the opportunities of Brexit as the months and the years progress. And as you say, Joe, uh, none of this, very much, very little of this has been decided yet. So, you know, there's all, all to play for. Uh, and I very much hope that conduct members will, will take, a, take a role in uh, driving that agenda forward. So thank you all very much for joining us and have a lovely evening.